Indian mathematics emerged in the Indian subcontinent from 1200 BC until the end of the 18th century. In the classical period of Indian mathematics, important contributions were made by scholars like Ayabhata, Brahmagupta, Mahavira, Bhaskara II, Madhava of Sangamagrama and Nilakan Yaji. The decimal number system in use today was first recorded in Indian mathematics. Indian mathematicians made early contributions to the study of the concept of zero as a number, negative numbers, arithmetic, and algebra. In addition, trigonometry was further advanced in India, and, in particular, the modern definitions of sine and cosine were developed there. These mathematical concepts were transmitted to the Middle East, China, and Europe and led to further developments that now form the foundations of many areas of mathematics. Ancient and medieval Indian mathematical works, all composed in Sanskrit, usually consisted of a section of sutras in which a set of rules or problems were stated with great economy in verse in order to aid memorization by a student. This was followed by a second section consisting of a prose commentary that explained the problem in more detail and provided justification for the solution. In the prose section, the form was not considered so important as the ideas involved. All mathematical works were orally transmitted until approximately 500 BCE. Thereafter, they were transmitted both orally and in manuscript form. The oldest extant mathematical document produced on the Indian subcontinent is the Birch Bark Bakshali manuscript. Discovered in 1881 in the village of Bakshali, near Peshawar and is likely from the 7th century CE. A later landmark in Indian mathematics was the development of the series expansions for trigonometric functions by mathematicians of the Kerala school in the 15th century CE. Their remarkable work, completed two centuries before the invention of calculus in Europe, provided what is now considered the first example of a power series. However, they did not formulate a systematic theory of differentiation and integration, nor is there any direct evidence of their results being transmitted outside Kerala. Prehistory Excavations at Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro and other sites of the Indus Valley civilization have uncovered evidence of the use of practical mathematics. The people of the IVC manufactured bricks whose dimensions were in the proportion 4, 2, 1. Considered favorable for the stability of a brick structure, they used a standardized system of weights based on the ratios 1 20th, 1 10th, 1 5th, 1 half, 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, and 500, with the unit weight equaling approximately 28 grams. They mass produced weights in regular geometrical shapes, which included hexahedra, barrels, cones, and cylinders, thereby demonstrating knowledge of basic geometry. The inhabitants of Indus civilization also tried to standardize measurement of length to a high degree of accuracy. They designed a ruler, the Mohenjo-Daro ruler, whose unit of length was divided into ten equal parts. Bricks manufactured in ancient Mohenjo-Daro often had dimensions that were integral multiples of this unit of length. Vedic period Samhitas and Brahmanas The religious texts of the Vedic period provide evidence for the use of large numbers. By the time of the Yajurveda Sarvita, numbers as high as 10-12 were being included in the texts. For example, the mantra at the end of the Anahoma performed during the Asvamida, and uttered just before, during, and just after sunrise, invokes powers of ten from a hundred to a trillion. Hail to Sata, hail to Sahasra, hail to Ayuta, hail to Niyuta, hail to Prayuta, hail to Abhada, hail to Nyabhada, hail to Samudra. Hail to Madhya, hail to Anta, hail to Parada, hail to the dawn, hail to the twilight, hail to the one which is going to rise, hail to the one which is rising, hail to the one which has just risen, hail to Svaga, hail to Marchya, hail to all. The solution to partial fraction was known to the Rigvedic people as states in the Purush Sutta, with three-fourths Purusa went up. 
One fourth of him again was here. The Satipatha Brahmana contains rules for ritual geometric constructions that are similar to the Silva Sutras. Alba Sutras The Alba Sutras list rules for the construction of sacrificial fire altars. Most mathematical problems considered in the Alba Sutras spring from a single theological requirement, that of constructing fire altars which have different shapes but occupy the same area. The altars were required to be constructed of five layers of burnt brick with the further condition that each layer consists of 200 bricks and that no two adjacent layers have congruent arrangements of bricks. According to, the Old Sutras contain, the earliest extant verbal expression of the Pythagorean theorem in the world. Although it had already been known to the old Babylonians, the diagonal rope of an oblong produces both which the flank and the horizontal, less than ropes greater than produced separately. Since the statement is a sutra, it is necessarily compressed and what the ropes produce is not elaborated on, but the context clearly implies the square areas constructed on their lengths and would have been explained so by the teacher to the student. They contain lists of Pythagorean triples, which are particular cases of Diophantine equations. They also contain statements about squaring the circle and circling the square. Bao Diana composed the Bao Diana Sulva Sutra, the best known Sulva Sutra, which contains examples of simple Pythagorean triples, such as and, as well as a statement of the Pythagorean theorem for the sides of a square, the rope which is stretched across the diagonal of a square produces an area double the size of the original square. It also contains the general statement of the Pythagorean theorem. The rope stretched along the length of the diagonal of a rectangle makes an area which the vertical and horizontal sides make together. Bao Diana gives a formula for the square root of two. The formula is accurate up to five decimal places, the true value being 1.41421356. This formula is similar in structure to the formula found on a Mesopotamian tablet from the old Babylonian period, which expresses square root 2 in the sexagesimal system, and which is also accurate up to five decimal places. According to mathematician S. G. Dunny, a Babylonian cuneiform tablet plimped in 322 written California, 1850 BCE, contains 15 Pythagorean triples with quite large entries, including which is a primitive triple, indicating, in particular, that there was sophisticated understanding on the topic in Mesopotamia in 1850 BCE. Since these tablets predate the Sulba Sutras period by several centuries, taking into account the contextual appearance of some of the triples, it is reasonable to expect that similar understanding would have been there in India, Danny goes on to say. As the main objective of the Sulva Sutras was to describe the constructions of altars and the geometric principles involved in them, the subjects of Pythagorean triples, even if it had been well understood may still not have featured in the Sulva Sutras. The occurrence of the triples in the Sulva Sutras is comparable to mathematics that one may encounter in an introductory book on architecture or another similar applied area, and would not correspond directly to the overall knowledge on the topic at that time. Since, unfortunately, no other contemporaneous sources have been found it may never be possible to settle this issue satisfactorily. In all, three Sulva Sutras were composed. The remaining two, the Manavar Sulva Sutra composed by Manavar and the Apastamba Sulva Sutra composed by Apastamba, contained results similar to the Baudhayana Sulva Sutra. Via Karana an important landmark of the Vedic period was the work of Sanskrit grammarian, Panini. His grammar includes early use of Boolean logic, of the null operator, and of context-free grammars and includes a precursor of the Bakasen AUR form, Pingala. Among the scholars of the post-Vedic period who contributed to mathematics, the most notable is Pingala, a musical theorist who authored the Chanda Shastra, a Sanskrit treatise on prosody. There is evidence that in his work on the enumeration of syllabic combinations, 
Pingala stumbled upon both the Pascal triangle and binomial coefficients, although he did not have knowledge of the binomial theorem itself. Pingala's work also contains the basic ideas of Fibonacci numbers. Although the Chanda Sutra hasn't survived in its entirety, a 10th-century commentary on it by Haliada has. Haliada, who refers to the Pascal triangle as Meru Prastara, has this to say. Draw a square. Beginning at half the square, draw two other similar squares below it, below these two, three other squares, and so on. The marking should be started by putting one in the first square. Put one in each of the two squares of the second line. In the third line put one in the two squares at the end and, in the middle square, the sum of the digits in the two squares lying above it. In the fourth line put one in the two squares at the ends. In the middle ones put the sum of the digits in the two squares above each. Proceed in this way. Of these lines, the second gives the combinations with one syllable, the third the combinations with two syllables. The text also indicates that Pingala was aware of the combinatorial identity. Katyayana Katyayana is notable for being the last of the Vedic mathematicians. He wrote the Katyayana Solva Sutra, which presented much geometry, including the general Pythagorean theorem and a computation of the square root of two correct to five decimal places. Jain Mathematics Although Jainism as a religion and philosophy predates its most famous exponent, the great Mahavira, most Jain texts on mathematical topics were composed after the 6th century BCE. Jain mathematicians are important historically as crucial links between the mathematics of the Vedic period and that of the classical period. A significant historical contribution of Jain mathematicians lay in the freeing Indian mathematics from its religious and ritualistic constraints. In particular, their fascination with the enumeration of very large numbers and infinities led them to classify numbers into three classes. Innumerable, innumerable and infinite. Not content with the simple notion of infinity, they went on to define five different types of infinity. The infinite in one direction, the infinite in two directions, the infinite in area, the infinite everywhere, and the infinite perpetually. In addition, Jain mathematicians devised notations for simple powers of numbers like squares and cubes which enabled them to define simple algebraic equations. Jain mathematicians were apparently also the first to use the word shunya to refer to zero. More than a millennium later, their appellation became the English word zero after a tortuous journey of translations and transliterations from India to Europe. In addition to Surya Prajnapta, important Jain works on mathematics included the Vaishali Ganit, the Sternanga Sutra, the Anoyadwar Sutra, and the Satkhandagama. Important Jain mathematicians included Badrabahu, the author of two astronomical works, the Badrabahavi Samhita and a commentary on the Surya Prajnapta, Jata Vrishama Charya who authored a mathematical text called Tiloya Panati, and Umasvati, who, although better known for his influential writings on Jain philosophy and metaphysics, composed a mathematical work called Tatwadhadagama Sutra Bhashya, oral tradition. Mathematicians of ancient and early medieval India were almost all Sanskrit pandits, who were trained in Sanskrit language and literature, and possessed a common stock of knowledge in grammar, exegesis and logic. Memorization of what is heard through recitation played a major role in the transmission of sacred texts in ancient India. Memorization and recitation was also used to transmit philosophical and literary works as well as treatises on ritual and grammar. Modern scholars of ancient India have noted the truly remarkable achievements of the Indian Pandits who have preserved enormously bulky texts orally. For millennia, styles of memorization prodigious energy was expended by ancient Indian culture in ensuring that these texts were transmitted from generation to generation with inordinate fidelity. For example, memorization of the sacred Vedas included up to 11 forms of recitation of the same text. 
The texts were subsequently proofread by comparing the different recited versions. Forms of recitation included the Jatapatha in which every two adjacent words in the text were first recited in their original order, then repeated in the reverse order, and finally repeated again in the original order. The recitation thus proceeded as Word 1 Word 2 Word 2 Word 1 Word 1 Word 2 Word 2 Word 3 Word 3 Word 2 Word 2 Word 3 In another form of recitation, the Vijapatha or a sequence of N words were recited by pairing the first two and last two words and then proceeding as Word 1 Word 2 Word and minus 1 Word and Word 2 Word 3 Word and minus 3 Word and minus 2 Word and minus 1 Word and Word 1 Word 2 The most complex form of recitation, Ganapatha, according to, took the form Word 1 Word 2 Word 2 Word 1 Word 1 Word 2 Word 3 Word 3 Word 2 Word 1 Word 1 Word 2 Word 3 Word 2 Word 3 Three, word 3 Word 2 Word 2 Word 3 Word 4 Word 4 Word 3 Word 2 Word 2 Word 3 Word 4 That these methods have been effective is testified to by the preservation of the most ancient Indian religious text, the GVDA, as a single text, without any variant readings. Similar methods were used for memorizing mathematical texts, whose transmission remained exclusively oral until the end of the Vedic period. The sutra genre mathematical activity in ancient India began as a part of a methodological reflection on the sacred Vedas, which took the form of works called Vedangas, or ancillaries of the Veda. The need to conserve the sound of sacred texts by use of siksa and chandas, to conserve its meaning by use of via karana and nirukta, and to correctly perform the rites at the correct time by the use of kalpa and jotisa, gave rise to the six disciplines of the Vedangas. Mathematics arose as a part of the last two disciplines, ritual and astronomy. Since the Vedangas immediately preceded the use of writing in ancient India, they formed the last of the exclusively oral literature. They were expressed in a highly compressed mnemonic form, the Sutra. The knowers of the Sutra know it as having few phonemes, being devoid of ambiguity, containing the essence, facing everything being without pause and unobjectionable. Extreme brevity was achieved through multiple means, which included using ellipsis beyond the tolerance of natural language, using technical names instead of longer descriptive names, abridging lists by only mentioning the first and last entries, and using markers and variables. The sutras create the impression that communication through the text was only a part of the whole instruction. The rest of the instruction must have been transmitted by the so-called Guru Shishya Paramparai, uninterrupted succession from teacher to the student, and it was not open to the general public and perhaps even kept secret. The brevity achieved in a sutra is demonstrated in the following example from the Baudhyana Alba Sutra. The domestic fire altar in the Vedic period was required by ritual to have a square base and be constituted of five layers of bricks with 21 bricks in each layer. One method of constructing the altar was to divide one side of the square into three equal parts using a cord or rope to next divide the transverse side into seven equal parts, and thereby subdivide the square into 21 congruent rectangles. The bricks were then designed to be of the shape of the constituent rectangle and the layer was created. To form the next layer, the same formula was used, but the bricks were arranged transversely. The process was then repeated three more times in order to complete the construction. In the Baudhyana Alba Sutra, this procedure is described in the following words. 2. 64. After dividing the quadrilateral in 7, one divides the transverse cord in 3. 2. 65. In another layer one places the bricks, north pointing. According to, the officiant constructing the altar has only a few tools and materials at his disposal. A cord, two pegs, and clay to make the bricks. 
concision is achieved in the sutra, by not explicitly mentioning what the adjective transverse qualifies. However, from the feminine form of the adjective used, it is easily inferred to qualify cord. Similarly, in the second stanza, bricks are not explicitly mentioned, but inferred again by the feminine plural form of north pointing. Finally, the first stanza never explicitly says that the first layer of bricks are oriented in the east-west direction, but that too is implied by the explicit mention of north pointing in the second stanza. 4. If the orientation was meant to be the same in the two layers, it would either not be mentioned at all or be only mentioned in the first stanza. All these inferences are made by the officiant as he recalls the formula from his memory.